Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to this episode of Behind the Veil. Today I'm joined with Khadija Safari. Assalamu alaikum Khadija. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me here. It's such a pleasure to have you. I was doing some research about you yesterday and what a journey and, and life you have had. Subhanallah, you are a British Italian revert. Mm -hmm. CEO of Safari MMA, where I am right now, and mashallah, tabarakallah, what a beautiful place. You are the first uh, woman to open a martial art club for women only in the UK. Yes. Wow, we'll talk about that. <laughs> and a black belt athlete as well. And yes. a um, business mentor on top of that for women. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yes, it's been a journey. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you, Khadija. Um, you and I, we have this thing in common, which is that we believe that whatever women are doing, they're doing it for a reason, especially mm -hmm. when they are in business. Absolutely. So the first question that I have for you is, what is your mission and why is it your mission? I love that. So I think something I always try and keep at the forefront of my own mind is the fact that I'm not going to live forever. No one is. The only guarantee we have is death. And... After I'm not here anymore, I want the work that I'm doing to continue. So there is a plan for a legacy. And it's so that when I'm no longer here as well, those good deeds that I have put in, inshallah, they keep multiplying. Because as Muslims, we know that any action we make is towards the deeds that we're building. So I want all of my platforms. So Safari Health Hub, Safari MMA, the Safari Coaching, they all have the same baseline. And that is that I want women to become the best versions of themselves without having to compromise their faith or values. Wow. And has it always been something that you were driven to do? This specific business? This mission? Or the yeah. mission, no. My, my mission definitely changed. And I think that's something really important to address is that your mission can change on your journey. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to stay the same forever. You can set yourself a goal, reach that goal, reinvent, set new goals, look at your mistakes. My initial mission was purely self-driven. It was purely the fact that I chose to become Muslim, alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. in 2009. And in doing so, I had to make a decision between, am I going to follow strongly with this faith and this passion that I now have for Islam? Or am I going to continue my training in Muay Thai? And it was a bit of a crossroad journey because Muay Thai is a very male-dominated industry. Martial arts is in general. I was usually the minority of women within the class. Like sometimes there was just me, sometimes there were maybe a maximum of three, four women. And then I just sat with myself and I was like, why am I even allowing that to be a question in my mind? I can't sit and wait for the big corporations to do something about my needs. The only way I can do that is to make a change myself. Like be the change you want to see. And so that's what made me open the UK's first women's only martial arts club. So I never did it with the mission to build a platform so that women can have self-belief. A lot of the things that I've done along the way came organically off the back of that one decision of, I want to find somewhere to train. It doesn't exist, so I'll open it. Mm -hmm. And it's been an absolutely beautiful, incredible journey because I've learned so much about the barriers that women face let's just say in self-belief alone, let alone within the platform of sport or what they should or shouldn't be doing or cultural barriers. It's been a non-stop learning curve. And the more I've learned, the more it's then driven me to want to make a difference in that and to do so so that women know they can do whatever they want to do. They just have the guidelines and they don't need to compromise their Islam. Their deen. You don't need to. You just need to build it in a way that works for you, and that's what I feel like as a community, we just need to drive and push for more. Yeah, you said something very interesting, two things actually. The first one is that when there's no table where you are welcomed or where you feel comfortable, you should create your own table, Absolutely. which is a motto in my life as well. Mm -hmm. This is how I felt growing up in France where there was no space for Muslim women to be Muslim and to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's either you leave or you create a space which is yours yeah. with your own rules. And then the second thing you said that was interesting was that your mission has changed at some yeah. point. I work with a lot of women who have started degrees, mm -hmm. pushed by their parents. They've completed those degrees in the medical field a lot of the time, and they're miserable. Mm -hmm. And they take an interest in coaching, 
but they always see coaching as this side hustle that they're hiding. It's almost like... The word side hustle as well. I hate that. They want to do it 100%. They want to commit to it. But there's that shame of like, but I've spent so many years studying medicine or whatever it is. My parents are going to be so disappointed if, if I let that go. Even if the amount of money they could be making in the coaching industry would be higher. Much higher. Uh, much higher. So it's not even a financial thing. It's like this block of my old self has decided that this was going to be my path. And it's not even their old self. A lot of the time is their family. I cannot let go of that. Ultimately, it's just I've spent my entire life building a life that somebody else wanted for me. That's the baseline. Yeah. And that's why I think any work which can promote self-belief is so important. Because when you understand yourself and who you are and you strip away anybody's expectations, whether that's a person or society as a whole, and you take that away, you start to really see who you are as a person and you sit with yourself and you decide what's important to you not what's important for other people and then that leads on to building healthy relationships healthy everything off the back of that is so much more powerful um and i think it's something that everybody should strive for is to always become the best version of yourself and i say about missions changing one of the best insults that i've ever been told is you've changed you're not who you used to be. Mm. No, why would I want to be who I used to be? Every 12 months, you should get to know me again because I am working on myself. Like, I am trying to improve. I am trying to learn. I'm trying to broaden my knowledge. I'm trying to become more patient. I'm trying to become more empathetic. Like, I'm not very good with empathy. Like, I'm trying to improve all, the th all of my weaknesses but focus even more on my strengths as mm. well. Yeah. So, yeah. I see a lot of people pleasing tendencies and, and that desire to hold on to our old selves for the sake of maintaining relationship with people. Mm -hmm. And in the way that I envision things is that there's two types of people pleasing. There's people pleasing for the sake of Allah, yeah. which is beautiful and we should all engage in it because the intention is to get a reward from him and no one else. Mm -hmm. You're not expecting anything. And then there's the other type of people pleasing with a lot, which a lot of us engage in which is i want recognition i want validation from people and the only way that i'm going to get it is by doing everything that they want me to do well i think when you people please and when you stay the person that people want you to be then they never really know you you're not building any relationship because they know the person that they'd like you to be which is why quite often you lose many people in your life when you do upgrade yourself when you do work on yourself because they lose the person that worked for them yeah and in those relationships yourself you don't really feel that bond that connection that deep friendship really mm -hmm. because you're not being yourself you're putting up a mask and that's tiring actually and the more you do it the more you provide a version of yourself that's not you the more you have to build up on that persona that you've created and the more quite often people they believe that is actually who they are. Mm. So they actually start to believe it themselves as well. For many years, I believed that I was confident because I was showing the world that I was confident and everybody I knew thought I was confident. But it wasn't until I became Muslim and I thought about wearing a hijab and I was like, absolutely not. No way am I wearing a hijab. I'm not doing it. And I had to sit with myself and be like, what's my reasoning for that? And I realized I worry what people will think. And so I was like, subhanAllah, like, I'm not confident. I actually worry what people think. And even though I've spent my entire life saying, I don't care what people think of me, I'm going to do what I want. It's just what I'd heard, and it was just what I was repeating, and it's what people thought I was. And I actually started to believe it about myself, and I had to put it to the test mm. and put on that hijab and walk out. And I wasn't even Muslim. Because I was learning about Islam, right? So I was like, uh, well, there's no way that I would personally ever wear the hijab. So I did it. I put on the hijab and I walked out and I was petrified until the first woman came up to me on High Street Kensington. She stopped me. She was like, excuse me, assalamu alaikum. Like, I didn't even know how to respond, right? She was like, do you know where the nearest bank is or the nearest cash point? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's like, I, just, I told her where it was. And I was like, I wouldn't normally have got approached for that probably. Mm. Right? And then I walked into a shop and the guy serving me in the shop was like, hi, ma'am, how can I help? And I was like, that is a different way of being spoken to. 
Mm. You know? So you have to test what it is you believe about yourself. And just because other people believe something of you, that doesn't mean that's who you are. You have to dig deep into that. That's why I love traveling and going to places where no one knows me. Mm. Because... I notice the shift in how comfortable or uncomfortable I am doing certain things mm -hmm. or behaving a certain way. Because a lot of us, when we are surrounded by our family members, we are stuck in our old selves. Yeah. No matter how much healing you do, sometimes you go back home and you're just like, oh, people pleasing, um, a shy, introverted self. And it, it is disturbing, but it's a constant growth journey. Um, mm. You've mentioned the hijab. Mm. there's something that I, I wanted to ask you before you became an entrepreneur were you in a nine to five so yes I was my story of education and work is that although I did them and I went to uni I never saw things all the way through because I didn't want to waste my time so I am the girl and you know this is something I didn't talk about for ages because I didn't want to discourage anybody from going down the really academic route but now I feel like I can talk about it and it's up to people to make their own decisions I was one of those kids that did well at stuff without really putting too much effort in but I never even had the drive to put a lot of effort in completed GCSEs went to do A levels did them for six months six months into them I was like this is a waste of my life How, like I knew from a young age I would say that if I say from a young age let's say from like 12 12 or 13 I initially wanted to be a vet and then I was like no scrap that A levels like the A's and stuff that you have to get each, like animals at that age right I don't want to work for someone else I will have my own business and I've always been what we would call like a hustler like side hustles was always my thing from the age of 12 I was making money at the age of 12 like I would always find a way to make money when I went to uni I was finding ways to make money whether it was working or not working or downloading I was getting free sim cards off the internet and selling them as gold numbers like all of this stuff I was always finding a way to be able to be self-sufficient I did end up in a job for five years it wasn't a nine to five it was a eight till eight 12 hours a day six days a week but I was doing marketing and the only reason I stayed in that company was because the guy that owned the company was actually good at what he did and I wanted to learn those skills and I was very honest about it. I remember talking about a pay rise or something. And I was like, you know, the only reason I'm here is because I want to learn from you. And they tried to bring me in as a director, like tried to give me a share of the company. I was like, I don't want it. You're just trying to trap me. Mm. And it took a lot to leave because every time I left, they tried to pull me back. But I knew that there was no way I was happy for any human being on this planet to have that am amount of control over my life over where I go, what time I have my lunch, who I see, who I spend the majority of my time with, if I can go on holiday. I did not like any of that. But I was brainwashed, I would say, all by my own fault, right, for about three to four years of this concept of working hard is, the, like, is a high performer, like you become a high achiever the more you put in. Because I was the one that was bringing in the most sales. I was literally like running these, these, this chain of salons. But I did suddenly just get to this point where I was like, this is controlling way too much of my life and I'm not able to do the things that I want to do. Now I'm ready to leave. I've got the tools I need. And I left. And I literally started my first proper business because I'd had small things going on. But my first business, like the day I left, I set up my first website design company and traveled, literally bought a one-way ticket and off I went, started to travel. So this is what I want to focus on for a second risk taking yeah because a lot of women are in a situation where they feel comfortable mm -hmm. comfortable but not fulfilled yeah and their heart is yearning for more they they're yearning for that independence that you mentioned that freedom that control over their time and maybe even the desire to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more mm -hmm. how did you make that decision I find risk taking super easy Firstly, I love challenges. I love risks. Throw me in at the deep end and I'll thrive. Like, I'll find a way out. And sometimes you, some people need to be in a kind of critical situation to actually make it push them. Risk-taking as a Muslim woman is the easiest thing to do. Because, firstly, we know we're not going to be here forever. All right? So that's just always at the, like, the back of my mind in any decision I'm making. 
set very clear intentions. What are my reasons for wanting to do this? Why do I want it? These are my intentions. Right now, pray istikhara, make dua on it. Then put in the action, put in the work. Either it's going to work or it's not going to work. What do you have to lose? Absolutely nothing. What you have to lose is everything if you're staying stuck in the same position and going nowhere. So for me, risk-taking is one of the easiest things to do. And I just very, first of all, as I said, I put it to Allah, but I'm also very calculated in how I analyze that, that risk. How much of my effort will it take to get the results that I need? And is that effort worth it? Because what I don't want to do is say, well, that's my goal. But it's going to take over my entire life. I'm going to have to give up everything that I believe in and everything that I do to be able to get to that goal. That's not a risk worth taking. Mm. Will it compromise what's important to me, what my values are, what my faith says? Like, will it compromise those things? If not, then I'm going for it. A very powerful exercise I like doing with my clients is asking them to project themselves in the future on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. And this is especially powerful for people who struggle to make decisions. Yeah. Decisions that put them in, in a situation where they're out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, what would I regret not doing? There's a really interesting, um, I say documentary that I saw where they went round to people on their deathbed, to elderly people, and they asked them, what's the biggest regret you have in life? And the two biggest things were not doing the things I wished I wanted to do. And the second one was not telling people how I really feel. Yeah. We come back to the people pleasing again. <laughs> so less people pleasing and more risk taking. 100%. 100%. And for me, comfort zone is not exciting for me. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not somebody that just wants to be doing the same thing on repeat for the rest of my life. I can't actually think of anything worse than doing the same thing on repeat for the rest of my life without any direction or any purpose in doing it. You work with different types of women and you and I know that not everyone is like us, right? Because mm -hmm. we've got this in common. How would you advise a woman who is not like this in nature and who has a fearful temperamental personality type? How can she become more of a risk taker in order to be more fulfilled? I think one of the most important things is to surround yourself with the people that make you want to be the best version of yourself. Because mm. if that is your temperament and that is your personality, then surrounding yourself with other people like that, just to be comfortable, is going to get you nowhere. So force yourself into new surroundings of people who are already doing what it is that you want to do. Firstly, you'll see it's possible. Secondly, the conversation will be different. And I think... Who you surround yourself with is really, really key. Obviously, you have your family. Whatever relationships you have, they're there. But you still have a choice of who you spend your time talking to. Don't waste that time. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with letting go of certain relationships and building new ones if it makes you closer to Allah and makes you a better version of yourself. Do it. I think that would probably be my first, my first thing. Obviously, pray, make the what, that you, this is your intention and this is what you want. But you have to step out of your comfort zone to become a better version of yourself. Otherwise, you stay as you are. Absolutely. Studies show that athletes who train with other athletes that are ahead of them perform better eventually and they just reach the same level. Because you realize it's possible. And I think that's one of the most common problems that people have is they see the people that are winning to be something different than what they are. But there is no difference. We all have the same ability to achieve, but you have to take the steps to make it happen. Mm. And that's why I'm so keen on getting mentors, and I know you're the same, because mm. we see the value in that. I don't know about you, but it took me a lot of time to actually invest mm -hmm. in one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Yeah. I did the whole group thing and the self-paced course thing, but I would say there's nothing like having someone that talks to you every week and tells you exactly how you're doing and what you're not doing well and holds you accountable. And a lot of people have this resistance to invest in themselves because they only see the price tag. I think the resistance comes for one of three reasons. Either the person they're speaking to they can't relate to, so it's not the right person for them. Or they don't understand the value of how that person can bring positive change to their life but the most common one is actually the belief in themselves they don't believe that they're capable of achieving it so they might believe that what you have to offer is real 
and that you are the real deal and you know what you're talking about. But their self-worth and their self-belief is so low that they don't believe they're capable of achieving it. Mm. And it, I just say like the biggest thing at that point is just start. Just go back to that. I have nothing to lose by trying. I have everything to lose by not trying. Absolutely. Now, coming back to you starting your journey as an entrepreneur, mm. starting this place, the first martial art, martial art club for women mm -hmm. in the UK. Being a pioneer in any field is difficult, especially as a Muslim woman. What are the types of ob obstacles that you faced and how did you overcome them? People. 100% it's always people and I would say I am now at a point in my life where I can genuinely say I don't care what people think you have to reach that point if you know that all you care about is what Allah sees from you if you can have that connection then you can achieve anything with Allah's permission right I face criticism from every angle when I started Safari so I launched Safari in 2010 not with the intention to, well, it, the intention was personal. The intention was personal at that point. It wasn't even for other people. I got criticized from non-Muslims that I'm causing segregation, that I'm making Muslim women become even more segregated than what they already are by having them in a women's only environment. I got criticized by martial arts groups that I had no idea what I was doing. Because I've now got a hijab on my head at that point. So they, they definitely think I've got no idea what I'm doing. And then I got criticized by the Muslims for trying to make women become like men. And for um, teaching them to be violent and aggressive. SubhanAllah. When I'm actually teaching them self-defense and teaching them how to be mentally strong. I mean, I don't even need to go into the benefits. Mm. To start with, I was like, well, I remember like the first newspaper article that I did. And the, the media jumped onto me very quickly. I never, people think I paid for PR. I never paid for a penny of PR. It literally was, they were like begging me within the first year, please can we interview you? Pure, not because I'm great at martial arts. It's purely because I'm a woman with a hijab on my head doing Muay Thai. Like, what is that? <laughs> like, and I remember the first article I released and then the comments that started coming after it. And I was like, What's wrong with these people? And to start with, I was like replying to them. And I was like, no, but actually the reason is this. And I'm explaining myself. Then I remembered you can't argue with a fool. Like you can't have that conversation. And I just stopped. Like I, some of the comments are hilarious. I've actually saved them all on my phone. Some of them were like, oh, it's so good that she's learning martial arts. Now she can defend herself when her family try to honor kill her. Wow. Like some of the stuff was top level ignorance but as a revert I got it I understood it to be honest because I was ignorant before as well mm. so I understood why they have that view if you're reading the Sun newspaper or the Daily Mail and all the magazines and you spend your days watching I'm sorry to offend people that are watching these things but you're spending your days watching Big Brother or whatever it is you're watching I understand why you have those views if your news option is from one of those kind of providers that have that, uh, that ideology that they want to push, I understand why you have that view. Mm. You obviously have a choice whether to educate yourself or not, but I stopped taking it to heart. I stopped listening to any of it because it's like it doesn't matter what anybody says. I'm not going to stop. In fact, if anything, that's actually pushing me to go harder. I'm the kind of person, tell me, do you know what? Khadija, like, you can't really do this. I'll be like, oh, really? <laughs> Let me show you. Oh, let's go. Let's do it 10 times more. Yeah. You know? Yeah, competitor, mashallah, tabarakallah. <laughs> so this is when strangers criticize your mission. I have clients who decide that they want to become coaches, for example. And this is valid for any field, anyone who decides to pursue their passion. Mm -hmm. And the biggest enemy become family. Have you been, you or your clients, in a situation where you had to prove yourself to your family or prove your purpose to your family in order to liberate yourself from the shackles of the nine to five or whatever you were stuck in? Absolutely. So for me personally, my family aren't Muslim. My mum's English, my dad's Italian, and they have always 
always said, whatever makes you happy, go ahead and do it. Obviously, it's interesting when being happy means becoming a Muslim, because that doesn't always count, does it? <laughs> conditions, terms and conditions terms apply. Conditions with that happiness, like as long as it's not this. But in saying that, the majority, I would say, of women that come to me are those whose family wanted them to become an accountant, wanted to become a far, like in the pharmacy industry, a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist. These are the most common ones that I see. And it makes the family look good. Yeah. That's literally it. My daughter achieved this grade at uni. My daughter's gone to this uni. My daughter is now a doctor. I have a theory on the wage system in the world. And that is the higher paid the job, the more stress you need to bear. Because who else is going to stay in a job that, that creates that amount of stress or that ties you down that much if there isn't some sort of financial reward at the end of it? And I had this conversation with someone else and she's like, yeah, but I think being a waitress would be pretty stressful. I'm like, no, what about you're a lawyer or you're a barrister and you are responsible for the choices of somebody else's life and what happens to their future based on their actions, not knowing the true circumstances of that person's life. I think families don't necessarily think of the bigger picture of what impact these sorts of jobs can have on somebody's life. And I am not talking down on any job because we need people in all jobs in society. There's no way that everyone can become an entrepreneur. But you should be doing it out of choice because it's what you choose is right for you, not because it's your family's expectations. Mm -hmm. And quite often, I have many, at the moment, many of my clients who have not told their families what they're doing. And they're like, I can't tell them yet. Like, let me just, let me just make it successful first. And then I'll tell them. And I know one I was speaking to who, a sister I was speaking to who's really successful in her coaching right now, even now, even though she can show her family how successful it's going, they're still like, why didn't you go back to doing the job you were doing before? Yeah. They still don't get it. Mm. I think it all goes back to our definition of success. And for maybe the older generation, it is stability. Mm. And for them, stability is the nine to five. And subhanAllah, you would expect something else. Looking at it from the outsider's perspective on what Muslim women are supposed to do, you'd think that our parents want us to be stay-at-home mothers and housewives. But they are pushing us towards careers that are actually killing our femininity. 100%. And it happens from school, though. Yeah. So that conditioning happens from school. I heard my daughter was with her friend yesterday. She's 10. And her and her friend were having a conversation. What do you want to be when you grow up? Why is this a conversation? Like, if you want to do something when you grow up, it's your choice to do so. And you can explore what would be right for you. Mm. If you want to. And I think that's why women and men are very different in business. Because every woman that I have met that is successful in business does so to make a difference in the world. Mm. Whereas men, Islamically, it's their duty to provide, so it has to be financial. Whether they're making a difference to someone in the world or not, you know, great if they are. But if they're going out working and they are providing because it's their duty, that is a deed in itself. Yeah. Whereas for us, it's not a duty that we have to do necessarily right depending on circumstance but if we are choosing to do it i feel like the reasoning behind it is so different mm. and so beautiful and this is what makes the difference between burning out and not burning out in my opinion when i work because i need to survive i burn out without yes. a fail but when i work because i love my job and i see it making an impact on the ummah completely different story completely and different story life. and you have the energy to put time into something that has beautiful results mm, absolutely what you said earlier about family reminded me of my auntie and, and what she told me when I, I had just started coaching I was barely making money from it I was really passionate about it um, the same level of passion that I have now if not more but she looked me dead in the eyes and she said why are you putting so much effort into this just get married <laughs> and I was triggered because the reason why I had started my business was because I had 
just come out of a marriage in which I was fully dependent on my ex-husband, mm -hmm. which led me to being homeless, to not being able to defend myself when my child was taken away from me, and all of these things that broke my heart. Yeah. And so for me, it didn't make sense. How can you tell me this? When I just went through something where I was powerless. Yes. Powerless, completely left in the street. And your number one goal should be searching for a new husband. Going back into the loop of, of trauma and this vicious cycle. Without healing. Without healing. Just jump straight in. And subhanAllah, like, again, studies will show that women and people who get married a second time, a lot of the time will end up in another divorce. I truly believe it's because they don't take the time to heal before. And mm -hmm. that's for men and women, yeah. both the same thing. Absolutely. So it, there's different cultural perspective on women working. What is your input into this? Like, do you think it's the future of Muslim women to be working? If that's the case, is entrepreneurship the best option for them? Or should we just be open-minded and let everyone do what they want, basically? I mean, everyone should be able to choose to do what they want. Do I think that entrepreneurship is a great direction for women, for Muslim women? Absolutely. Because doesn't compromise what's important to you as a woman. And if you are a mother or you're thinking of becoming a mother or you want to be a homemaker, like this is the way to be able to keep that, to not have to be out working for somebody else, out of the house constantly, missing out on building relationships, whether that is with a child or with your partner or with your family or whoever that is. I do think that relationships are something that need work they're not something that you should just be bypassing each other when you get time and you're absolutely exhausted and you're in your worst possible state, you know, and then you've only got one day at the weekend or something to actually try and clear the house or whatever it is you want to do. So definitely I think women working should be an option, but I think they're very good at it. And I think it will bring a change to our ummah that is very much needed mm. to pave the way for a stronger ummah, a stronger society. And that is one of my other drives, is the fact that I feel that the Muslim community is weak. And people don't like it when I say that, but if you think about what's happening around the world right now, why is it only in times of tragedy that they start to come together? start to come together it's too late mm. why were we not strong in the first place think about what's happening in palestine right now the fact that they are the strongest in their iman, iman and we are the weakest and we are fragmented and attacking each other on who's sharing what who should be sharing more of this blah, blah, blah. what action are we taking for 12 months from now what action are we taking for five years from now because that's what we should be working towards i've had messages from people saying you know you shouldn't really still be sharing videos at the moment with what's going on i'm like no i should be sharing more now than what i was before because right now we need more muslim companies that are running properly so that we shouldn't have to be boycotting yeah so that we can also be making a difference. We can be ready with the aid. We can be ready with what we need so we can come together. Not, you're weak right now, so I'll make myself weak too. Mm. That to me makes no sense. And we have to start from now. We had to, should have started years ago. Why we're reinventing that so many years later, yeah. I don't know. SubhanAllah, you just have to look at the Sahabiyat, the female companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you remind me of Nusayba, the warrior. Like She was so proactive in wanting to defend Islam and she was on all the battlefields. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would same. compliment her so much, he would say she, she's the best. Mm -hmm. uh, until she died, she was taken care of by all the Khalifat, all, all the leaders of the Ummah, because she was regarded as a powerful woman in the community, mm -hmm. when the ancient Europe was not allowing women to help in any way during war, Muslims were already bringing women to be nurses on the battlefield. Women were working at the time of the Prophet wasallam in many different ways. Mm -hmm. We're just confusing culture and religion and thinking that women should stay at home when really Allah recognizes that we have a lot to offer. I mean, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated the most 
uh, hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was the biggest teacher. The companions would go to her when they had doubt about legal rulings. Mm -hmm. What does that say about the position of women in in our religion? It's like we're doing a full circle. We're going back to where we should be. Mm. But somewhere in between there is a whole load of culture that says that women should be doing nothing yeah. but taking care of the kids. So how, how are we going to do that if ourselves, we don't go out there and educate ourselves and participate in the community? And share knowledge. And share knowledge, mm -hmm. yes. So I think we need to st stop hiding ourselves, really, and stop allowing people to convince us that we should hide ourselves. And also something that the Muslim community seem to really use is money is the root of all evil. Mm. I personally think... Firstly, if you get money, it's from Allah, right? How you use that money is what is most important. Mm. And I think that money doesn't change people. I think it brings out the truth in people. I think it shows who you really are because if you are tested with money, with wealth, that's a big test because there's a lot of fitna out there and temptation out there when you are wealthy. Whereas when you have no options, it's just one way. So you really learn about a person, I yeah. think, when I they understand. when they have wealth. Mm. A lot of limiting beliefs about that. And knowing that all the companions of most of them were wealthy mm -hmm. is such a, a comfort as well as a business owner because it, it, it removes this idea that we're supposed to be miserable and struggle for the rest of our lives. Even if we know that there is reward in being poor in this life, Still, the Prophet ﷺ would teach us that as long as you don't hold your gains and your material goods in your heart, mm -hmm. it's okay to be happy with whatever Allah blesses you with. I mean, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, was rich. May Allah be pleased with him. Mm -hmm. Khadija was rich. And they permitted Islam to become what it became as well by financing its growth and its spread. Yeah. How are we going to be doing da'wah and introducing our beautiful religion to a maximum of people if we don't have the financial means to do so. Absolutely. And also, why are you asking to make yourself weaker than what you are right now? SubhanAllah. Why would you want that for yourself? In all honesty, I think it's an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's an excuse for the person that doesn't want to make the action. Obviously, there are circumstances where people have no choice. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people who have the choice to be able to work or to be able to put in an effort especially if it's going to contribute to positive impact on our community on our ummah and they choose not to and their excuse for that is well money makes you evil mm. these are limiting beliefs to sabotage ourselves subhanallah mm -hmm. now coming back on what you do what i'm hearing is that there's a lot going on mashallah tabarakallah do you think that balance is possible when you are a business owner, a mother, a woman, a wife, a sister, daughter, etc., etc.? Absolutely. Absolutely. Firstly, you choose when you want to work. I've got such a strict yet adaptable working routine. So if I need to adapt it and change it, I change it. I have I have intentional time and I think intentional time is really beautiful where I intentionally spend time with my husband. I intentionally spend time with my children. I intentionally spend time with my family or people that are important to me. That time is much more valuable than just being around each other because you have some free time. I schedule in. So on a Sunday, it's family day. Like that's it. It's blocked out. It's family day. Obviously, as I said, it's adaptable. But the same with my working. I work. I don't sit in front of my computer for hours in front of my children playing because I don't need to. I've made my schedule so I can be, can be completely adaptable. On top of that, I don't call it work. I call it my project mm. because it's something I choose to do and it's something I enjoy doing. Like for me, it's almost like a hobby. I don't think, oh, I've got to sit down and work for two hours it's not even a thought that crosses my mind i'm like oh i get to i get to focus on that next part of my project that i'm working on at the moment like i'm excited to do that i look forward to it i never dread a monday 
I never think, oh, no, it's Monday. Like, oh, I've got to, to... Well, firstly, I don't have to work on a Monday if I don't want to. But I never dread it. I actually look forward to Monday because on a Monday morning, I have blocked out four hours where I have no meetings. I don't speak to anybody during that period. And I focus on my plans for the week. And I'm really structured with that. I enjoy that. Mm. I actually do, do some of it on a Sunday evening. I do some of it on Sunday evening while planning for the week. And on the Monday, I execute the most important tasks. The things usually sometimes that I don't want to get done, I get them done first. The rest of my week is now nice and nice and clear to use as I want. So, no, there's like zero restrictions in my mind. And balance is key. Balance is really important. But you have to choose what's a priority for you. Mm. How has being an entrepreneur and business owner helped with your spiritual life? I can't even put a word on that, really. I feel like it's actually the only way to not compromise your work on your soul because you are capable of making a decision of how you do everything, of how you implement it. Like you can say, do you know what? That's not Islamic. I don't want to do it. Or I don't want to have that meeting because there's going to be men there and that's not for me. I'm just not going to go. You're capable of making these decisions or they're having a meeting in a place where I don't feel comfortable. Like, scrap all that. I want to have a meeting with that person and I'm going to arrange it in this place at this time. And that's it. It's the only way I feel that you're capable of having control over all of your decisions. So I think they run not only hand in hand, I feel like it improves my Islam because I'm able to implement the things that are important to me. Mm. And I get to do my business with my husband as well. Like we have this place together. So we have mutual things that we're able to work on rather than, as I said, being exhausted at the end of the day and being like, oh, what do you want to eat? Like, it's never like that. Yeah. So I think it's beautiful when you're able to put your Islam and your deen into all of your decisions because you make the decisions. Mm. Wow, that's really powerful. What I'm hearing is mainly regaining your energy and putting it into the things that will serve your dunya and your akhira. 100%. Mm. And dunya is temporary. So why would I not put the effort in right now whilst I'm here for the akhira? Why would I not do that? Mm. Because I feel like you waste your life otherwise. Somebody that works in a job that they don't enjoy or in a position that they don't enjoy gets to the end of the week and says, oh, I can't believe it's Sunday already, right? Or they look back and they're like, I don't know, you know, like it's December. They're like, I literally can't believe it's the end of the year. Where did the year go? I never feel like that. Yeah. I never feel like that because I can look back over the last month and say, I achieved this this month. Right? Like I achieved a lot in this month. Mm. I can see what I did and I can see what it was working towards. I wasn't just running on repeat for somebody else. So time can slip by if you don't have control over your own time. Mm. Subhanallah. And, and what else do we have in this life apart from our time, our health? Time is the biggest currency. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if you... You can be making 250k a year in... I don't know what job pays 250k a year. Maybe a lawyer, possibly. But you don't have your time. you got this money that's coming in, but you don't have your time. Mm. That money's worth nothing. Not only that, but the health repercussion of doing something that you don't enjoy day in and day out for years. Like, I'm sure you've seen it with your clients. It's like they come to you and it's not just their mental health that's affected. It's everything. Everything. Their physical, physical health. The fact that they're constantly feeling exhausted. Mm. The fact that they're using sugar and caffeine just as a pick-me-up followed by a crash and it's like on a constant... I mean, I like coffee. I enjoy, but I enjoy coffee because I enjoy drinking a coffee. It's not because I'm like, oh, it's getting to that time of the day. I need to like pick myself up. Take care of your health. I mean, that's the other thing. You have nothing if you don't have your health. Mm. It doesn't matter how much money you're making. Mm. If you're physically not capable of doing anything with yourself because your health is so bad, then what do you have? Like, take care of yourself. Your body is namana. Your body is temporarily given to you. <laughs> Like, take care of it. Your mind and your body, it's all one thing. Yeah. People separate the two, the mind and the body. 
it's one thing like take care of this as much as you're taking care of your body mm, absolutely i'm sure it took a lot of inner work to get where you are so i'm curious to know what did you have to let go of to become that woman i had to let go of who i thought i was to become who i wanted to be and it was all inner work You know, so many people ask me, oh, have you had counseling? Do you, you know, I've never had counseling. I've never had psychotherapy. I've never had any of that. I think the only experience I had of that was at university. I did graphic design and advertising. And during advertising, you have to learn about consumer psychology. And I remember that was a pivotal point for me because I remember this girl that used to live in the room next to me at uni, <clears throat> and I didn't like her. I didn't like her mindset. I didn't like how she bossed people around. I didn't like how she always picked the vulnerable, weak people. And then those vulnerable, weak people would pick her over anybody else because they didn't want to get in trouble with her. And then as I learned about psychology and a child and their upbringing and what effect this can have on them in the future, I actually went from feeling annoyed with her to feeling sorry for her. And it was at that point that I started to really think about all the people I knew. And I was like, what have they been through? to make them that person that they are now. And I started to work on myself then, really. And I had a big issue. I started to realize that I was unable to communicate, which I knew where that came from. That had come from my mum being not capable of communicating with me. My mum and I would sit in the same room, and if she wanted to ask me a question that had any form of emotion in it or wanted to know what I've been up to, she would write it on a piece of paper and pass it to me in the same room. Wow. So I didn't know how to speak to people. I could sell to people. I was great at sales, but if it came to a, a conversation about emotions, like if somebody started crying in front of me, I was like, like, please. Like if somebody had lost somebody in their family, I'm like, do not come to me. Please don't come to me. Please don't come to me. Like, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to have to give them a hug? Like, what am I going to Like, it was like a, Ugh. and I realized my problem, one of my problems that I had was because I wasn't very good at communicating with people. I would overthink their response to what it was I was thinking. So whatever it is I wanted to say to the person, say they'd done something. Because I also didn't communicate. I never explained myself to people. So if somebody thought something about me, I'd just be annoyed that they'd underestimated me. Mm. I'd be like, you really don't know me very well at all to think that that was my intention. Like they picked a negative intention. Like whatever it was that I did... I had good intention in what I was doing. It wasn't done with any malice. Half the time it was stuff that was just to defend myself, right? But I would internally get annoyed with them. And then I would let it build up and I would mentally make notes. This person said this and then they said this and then they said this and I would get to a list of like 10 things and then I would wait for them to really push my buttons and then I'd just let it all out and have a go at them because mm. I didn't know how to communicate. And I was like, this is actually a problem. This isn't good for me. And this isn't good for any relationship, whether it was a work relationship or whatever it is. And I remember going to a friend and saying to her, I was like, right, I'm going to have a go at communicating. I'm going to try and tell someone that I feel like I've got this issue that I need to work on. And let me just speak to someone about it. And I went to this friend and I was like, listen, I think I've got an issue that I really need to work on. I find it really hard to tell people what I'm thinking and I get worried that I'm going to annoy them or that they're going to get angry with me and I'd have all these ideas of what their response might be to what it was I was thinking and I was like oh, I don't really know what to do about it I really need to work on it and her response was hmm that was it she didn't know what to say to me because I picked the wrong person to go to so that was like well that was a waste of time so I'm never doing that again That just literally set me back even further. And it's a really important thing when it comes to coaching or whatever it is you're doing. Like, go to the right person that can help you to get what you want. Don't just go to anybody because the wrong person can cause you more harm than good. But yeah, I mean, it's something I've worked on now and now I'm pretty good at it. But it took a while, but it was internal work that I had to do on myself. Mm. One of my favorite quotes is, Don't try to buy milk at the hardware store. 100%. And that quote saved me because I was also the person who was begging the wrong people to give me guidance. Yes. And of course, we only get real and true guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what I find ridiculous sometimes is when people say, oh, 
you don't need all of this help. You don't need psychology. You don't need therapists. You don't need coaches. But it's like I've been praying for someone to help me or for something to change. And Allah has put someone good on my path. This is a blessing. Why would I deny it? Yeah. And this is why the thing that I love hearing from the woman that I get on a phone call with and who join our program is I made dua. I got up for tahajjud, for the night prayer. I was desperate. I prayed for something. The next day, I came across your content. Yep. And it's like, Allah Akbar. Yeah, subhanAllah. And the tagline of our training to be a coach is be the answer to someone's dua. Yes. Beautiful. That's exactly what we want to be doing. Beautiful. Relieving a soul that's suffering and making sense of the suffering that we went through as well. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with seeking help. Mm -mm. But as you said, you have to be persistent with it. You have to go to the right person as well. I think that's really key. And I think the mistake that most people make, and it was the mistake that I made, is we go to the person that we're most comfortable with going to. Not necessarily the person that will give us the answers that we need. Because mm. going to the person that's going to give you the answers that you need, it might have to hurt you at some point. Because you might need to do some unpacking. Yeah. yeah. But uh, comfort isn't the answer. Absolutely. So what would be a tip for the woman who's listening to us right now, thinking I'm not happy in my life at the moment. I might have the stable income and the friends, but I feel like something is missing. I just don't know what to do to find myself, find my purpose, take a step forward, change things. What would you advise that woman? I like to ask women where would they ideally like to see themselves and how would they like to see themselves 12 months from now, inshallah? And really think about what that looks like. Not to be like, well, maybe I'd like a pay rise at work. No, who would you like to be 12 months from now? Let's really explore that. What's your personality like? Where, does, where do you spend your time? Who are you surrounded by? What type of people are you surrounded by? Like, Think about where you'd ideally like to be then start to take the steps to actually make that a reality. Because mm. um, people do say, you know, I don't like to think too much into the future because, you know, we've got no guarantee of what's going to happen tomorrow. No, of course we haven't. And you know what? Your life might be taken tomorrow. But that doesn't mean you're going to make no action at all and no intention and just sit and say, well, everything's cut out Allah. Like, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. That's not what Allah wants for you. So... I like to get a person and actually I get them to describe themselves as someone else. What does she look like? What is she doing? Just to realize that they can become her because they can't see themselves as her right now because it's so far away in their mind and it's nowhere near where they are right this second. But then the second we've completed that task, then we start to work on right in the next four weeks to get to there, we're working on this. And then my other thing would be... Um, when you're really clear on how you see yourself 12 months from now, say no to anything that doesn't take you towards it. Because things will come, temptations will come, opportunities will come. And if you're saying yes and it's taking you away from your goal of where you want to be, it's not helping you. And sometimes there are real temporary fixes, especially when there's money involved. Well, I've temporarily been offered a contract for three months. But is it taking you towards what you're working towards? No. Then why are you taking it? Yeah. Why are you moving away from who you want to be? Mm. Just say no. And you know what? That's the toughest thing, subhanAllah. Because if anyone is like me, like we don't think twice before saying yes to things. Mm -hmm. I'm very impulsive. And I'm so grateful that I have a team to slow me down. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I told you earlier, <laughs> I have an operational manager that is grounding me. Because if it was me alone in the team, and it was like that before, mm -hmm. I would just say yes to every opportunity, whether yeah. they're paid or not whether there's khair in it or not, I'm just like, yes, I'm a yes woman. Mm -hmm. But slowing down and not having the fear of missing out is very powerful. This is also part of regaining the control over your time and energy. Now, if we come into the practicalities of how your day goes, are there any habits that you swear by? A few, I would say. One is time management. Don't just let your time pass and really analyze how you use your time and look at what pockets of that time you're wasting by doom scrolling, by watching whatever you watch. I mean, I don't have a TV for multiple reasons, but 
analyze the use of your time and think about how you would really like to use your time and actually write it down like have like 15 minute blocks throughout your entire day and be like well actually do you know what there's an hour and a half wasted there there's an hour and a half wasted there be consistent and accountable to yourself which is difficult to do the next one is get accountability from someone else so i've got the yes you need to be accountable to yourself you need to be committed to yourself because you shouldn't be doing it for somebody else and this is where having a mentor is very different to working for somebody else a mentor isn't telling you what to do for their own benefit because we don't need to be telling anybody what to do that's not a benefit to me a mentor is telling you or helping you do whatever is most beneficial for you and holding you accountable. And they should be temporary in your life, to be honest. Right? One mentor should not be a mentor that stays with you for your whole life. There will be stages where you'll need to change that. So be controlled with your own time. I wake up in the morning. I get my kids ready for school. They go to school. I come home, right, 9 o'clock. From 9 o'clock to quarter past 9, I will not do work. Projects, whatever you want to call it. I won't. I will make a cup of tea and play a game of chess. And I'll do it every morning because it's my nothing time. I don't want to think about what I'm going to be doing. I don't want to think about the, any rush that was there in the morning. I'm just going to have a moment where I'm just going to stimulate my mind a little bit, play a game, 15 minutes, quarter past nine, I'm refreshed and ready to go. Like be self-disciplined, but make sure you're including the stuff in there that brings you happiness. It can't just be, right, I'm going to work for this block and I'm going to work for this block and I'm going to work for this block and there's a block there I can work. No, that's an intentional time that I want to do something nice for my daughter. That's an intentional time. Like, if you're going to make a doctor's appointment, do the same thing for your own self-care. Do the same thing for your own intentions of how you want to spend your time. Do the same thing for your projects. And surround yourself by people that make you want to become the best version of yourself and how somebody that you can be accountable to that can guide you in the areas where you're weak mm, that's really powerful oh, i'm so inclined to ask do you have any tips for women who are looking for sisterhood and struggling with it i, I know that i for me it's easy alhamdulillah because i create the circles and so i get to meet the women that i i want to work with or that are inspiring but i feel like that's different Mm. I feel like there's a different, um, the way they speak to you would not be the way they would speak to somebody else. Mm. When you're, and I wanted to ask you this question earlier, actually, you become a role model to people without intentionally making that your goal. Mm. That I have at no point ever thought, oh, I'd really love to be a role model. Like, it's almost cringy just even <laughs> thinking about saying it, right? But you become a role model to those women. So the way they speak to you is very different to how they will speak to each other. Mm. so although there's that circle there there's that sisterhood there it's different because there's this different and although we say there's no hierarchy there is in terms of their level of respect and what their expectations are it's something i have now made an intentional action is to choose who i want to be around it's so important who do you want to speak to on a regular basis and how do they make you feel and how do they make you want to better yourself i've got a friend in London, her and her mum, who I don't see that often. I see them maybe once every four months. And I look forward to that because it's really revitalizing for my dean. It's such a beautiful conversation. I'm inspired every time I leave. Like, it makes me want to do more good. Like, they're the kind of people that I get excited to see. Don't waste your time with anybody that is just there for the chit chat. Like, set intentions of, of, of who you're spending that time with how to find it mm. that's a that's a tricky question because yeah. it's something i'm working on right now as well i do think that you do attract the people to you that can relate to you though it's so like the fact that me and you are sat here having this conversation like you're someone i would love to have another conversation with right so if you become the person that you want to attract like that's going to happen by itself. But if you just sit back saying, well, I'm just going to wait to meet somebody that's a bit more inspiring, like it's not going to happen. Mm. So I guess become the change you want to see. It goes back to that same message, message, become the change you want to see and you will attract the right people into your circle. Mm. And I give that advice for women who are looking for a spouse as well. Yeah. 
Uh, I think about all the sisters who message me and say, I don't know how to make friends because I'm isolated. There's not a lot of Muslims in my community, et cetera, et cetera. But I truly love the blessing of the internet sometimes because we can literally connect with anyone. And it can go through Instagram, through Facebook, through YouTube. Like It's just about being proactive and making those du'as, obviously. Ask Allah to put good people on your path, people who will bring you... I was you literally about to say people. that. I personally feel like Allah has brought the right people into my life at the right time every single time mm. and removed the ones that shouldn't be there. Every single time. I would never have become Muslim, well, Allah alim, but I would never have found out about Islam if I hadn't have met non-practical Muslims mm. because I wouldn't have been ready to meet a woman in a hijab. I would have thought we were two completely different people. Like, you know, I needed those stepping stones to gradually ease me because there's no way I was jumping in at the deep end. Yeah. So it's all about having that certainty and tying your camel, taking action. Beautiful hadith. Um, we pray, but we also do something about what we prayed for. Action. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Khadija, thank you so much for your company and for your wisdom. My pleasure. It's been a, a pleasure of mine. And me. how can people find out about what you do? So right now, Instagram is my main my main hub. So um, Khadija Safari B E M, and yeah, I'm not, I'm I'm there to support anybody that wants to better themselves. You know. So you guys go over Khadija's socials, inshallah, and uh, follow her and work with her, inshallah, if you can, because clearly she's got a lot to teach people, especially Muslim women. Inshallah, inshallah. and the same for you. Allahumma barik. Allahumma barik.